Hello friends. Welcome to yet another video series on accounting. Hey, my name is Vikash Goel and in this video we are going to talk about business combinations. Under the NAS environment, business combinations is defined and prescribed under NAS 103. It covers a much wider aspect than the erstwhile accounting standard 14 which used to talk about only evaluations. So we will briefly touch upon what, what NAS 103 talks about in terms of business combinations. First, let's understand what's a business. A business is an integrated set of activities and assets that is capable of being conducted and managed for the purpose of providing a return. These returns can be provided in the form of dividends, profits, lower costs or other economic benefits. Who do we provide this return to? It can be provided directly to the owners, investors, members or participants. A business is generally a set of inputs on which we apply some processes which has the capability of creating outputs. That's what a business would be generally under NAS 103. What's a business combination? A business combination is a transaction in which an acquirer obtains control of one or more businesses. It's very important to note here that 103 talks about the control. So whether the business has obtained control is more important rather than the transaction or the event. So India's 103 focuses on substance rather than the form of transaction. How can we get control uh, over one or more businesses? The control can be acquired through issue of cash, assets, equity instruments, by incurring liabilities or even without consideration. But what's important is that one entity, one acquirer should have obtained control over one or more businesses. Now when we talk about businesses acquired under section under NAS 103, the determination of whether the acquired assets is business or not is from the view of a market participant and not as per a buyer or a, or a seller. That is, it is really not important if the seller of the assets was using the set of assets as a business. It's again not important if the acquirer is going to use the assets as a business or not. The definition of business is seen from the viewpoint of a market participant, that is public in general, people in general, rather than the buyer or the seller. Under NDS 103, how do we do the accounting for business combinations? NDS 103 describes that all the accounting for business combinations has to be done as per the acquisition method. Now this is in contrast with the existing provisions wherein amalgamations are accounted for under pooling of interest method or under purchase method. As per current requirements, as per current practices, if one acquires a stake in a subsidiary or in a jointly controlled entity or an associate, the accounting is done as per carrying carry values. In case one acquires several assets together, the purchase consideration is apportioned over various assets on a fair basis as prescribed to the valuers. But in case 103 says that all business combinations must be accounted for under the acquisition method. Under the acquisition method, how do we calculate goodwill or capital reserve? So goodwill will be calculated as the total consideration transferred plus non-controlling interest less the fair value of all the identifiable assets. Whatever remains is goodwill or capital reserve as the case may be. Now let's understand some important steps in the acquisition method. The first step is identifying the acquirer. We've understood in the past that an acquirer is the entity that obtains the control over one or more businesses. Generally, it can be very straightforward to understand who the acquirer is. Usually, the acquirer would be the one who's paid the consideration in terms of assets, cash, equity, and However, in some cases, it can be very complicated, especially in cases where there has been an exchange of equity and students. In such cases, one should follow the guidance prescribed under NAS 110, that is Consolidated Financial Statements. But we need to remember that the acquirer would be the entity 
that has ultimately obtained control over the businesses. The next step is to identify the acquisition date. Now, an acquisition date is very important because it is the date from which the results of, of the acquired company would be included into the results or the financial statements of the acquirer company entity. It is the date on which the fair value of the acquired assets is also determined. The acquisition date is the date when the control is actually obtained. Now, it's important to remember that the acquisition is not necessarily the date of agreement. It is not necessarily the closing date of the financial statements as well. It is the date on which the actual control is obtained. For example, even if the entire transaction is complete, but there is a government approval that is pending, unless it is procedural in nature, the acquisition date would not be counted for unless the government approval is received. So again, generally acquisition date would be pretty straightforward, but one needs to identify when is the actual control which has been transferred from the acquired entity to the acquirer entity. The next step is to identify the consideration transfer. The consideration transfer is calculated as the acquisition date fair value of assets transferred by the acquirer. That is, on the date of acquisition, the fair value of assets that is being transferred by the acquirer to the acquired entity. The liabilities incurred by the acquirer to the former owners of the acquirer. For example, if there is any cash which is paid to the equity shareholders of the acquired entity. And the equity interests issued by the acquirer. Some of these would be considered as the total consideration transfer. It's important here again that consideration includes deferred consideration. So, for example, we've talked about liabilities that are incurred by the acquirer. So, any deferred consideration is also a part of the consideration transfer. All the deferred consideration has to be calculated at the present value for it to be included as part of the consideration. In case of any contingent consideration, if you look at the current practices, contingent considerations are payable, are adjusted with goodwill and is based on the contractual amount of consideration payable and is adjusted with goodwill when the contingency is resolved. However, under NDS, the con contingent consideration is calculated and is part of the consideration transferred at fair value. So this is very important. Consideration transferred includes acquisition date fair value of assets transferred by the acquirer, acquirer to the acquired entity. The liabilities incurred by the acquirer to the former owners of the acquiring. The equity interest in, uh, issue. It includes deferred consideration at present value. Adding, it includes contingent consideration at fair value. Under NDS, the acquisition related costs are excluded and expensed separately as and when incurred. For example, due diligence fees, audit fees, legal fees are excluded from the consideration and, are, and they are expensed in the profit and loss account of the entity where the expense has been incurred. Also, the amount which is not part of the combination are accounted for separately. For example, any pre-existing relationships, any amount paid to the employers, to the employees, to the current employees who are former owners of the acquiry. So for example, if the earlier owners of the acquiry entity have become your employees and if you are paying any amount to them, this would not form part of the consideration. Therefore, there are more guidances provided to spread under the NDS. Now let's understand the recognition, measure, the recognition and measurement under NDS. All the assets must meet the definition of all the assets or liabilities acquired must meet the definition of asset or liability as at the date of acquisition. We've already identified, we've already understood what is the acquisition date. So recognition can be done only for assets and liabilities which meet the definition of assets or liabilities on the date of acquisition. And these must be exchanged as part of the acquisition, as part of the business combination. If these are acquired separately, it would not fall under this accounting standard. The classification and designations of the assets and liabilities so acquired is made at the acquisition date 
as per the contractual terms and economic conditions and other conditions pertinent applicable on the date of acquisition. It is regardless of the classification made by the acquiring entity. In this case, there is an exception in case of lease and insurance contracts. For every other assets or liabilities acquired, it is made the classification is made as at the date of the acquisition based on the contractual terms and economic conditions and other conditions present. How do we measure such assets and liabilities? All the assets and liabilities are measured at fair value as at the date of acquisition. Some final points here. The non-controlling interest, which is currently called minority interest, is measured at fair value or the acquirer would have to show it as, as a proportionate share of fair value of the acquired company's net identifiable assets. Let me repeat, the non-controlling interest is disclosed at fair value or based on the proportionate share of fair value of the acquired company's net identifiable assets. In case of NDS, goodwill has to be tested for impairment under NDS 36, which is impairment of intangible assets, and is not supposed to be amortized, which is done as per current principles. In some cases, it is possible that the consideration transferred and the net identifiable assets acquired would result in a gain rather than a loss, or rather than a profit. In that case, According to NDS, the excess amount should be taken to the other comprehensive income and then accumulated in equity as part of capital reserves or it can be directly taken to the capital reserve. There is an important carve out here uh, as compared with IFRS which says that this excess amount should be taken to the profit and loss. So an important point to remember here that in case there is a capital reserve, in case there is a gain as part of the business acquisition, this amount should be transferred to the other comprehensive income and then accumulated in the equity through capital reserves or it can be directly taken to the capital reserve. And here, there is a difference between IFRS and NDS where IFRS says that this amount should be taken to the profit and loss. The next step under the acquisition method is to identify subsequent measurement for subsequent measurement of the assets and liabilities, one would have to follow the guidance provided in the other NDS. However, NDS 103 provides specific guidances for reacquired rights or contingent liabilities as at the date of acquisition. One important point to mention here is that the goodwill amount cannot be changed later unless there is a specific and additional information which is provided during the measurement period. And this measurement period cannot exceed 12 months. And this is very important. The standard also provides guidance for amalgamations or for business combinations which has been achieved in various stages. We are not covering this in this video. The standard also provides guidance for acquisitions as per code approved schemes, which is something that we are also not covering in this video. I hope you like the session. Thank you.